All right. Good morning, good morning, good morning. And welcome to Daring Dialogues. I am your host, Shante Charles. I hope that you all are having a great and wonderful morning. Good morning to those coming in. You can tap some hearts and put them on the screen so that we know that you are here. Good morning, Pastor Ben. Just getting my book set up here. I hope everybody is having a wonderful and fabulous Friday. And... We are going to get started in just a moment, just giving an opportunity for people to come in, as well as writing down some information for you all for today. All right. So, today is normally our um, Wealth Building Friday And we talk about business and we talk about um, principles for wealth building as well as business tips. And today's business tips are going to come from Anything You Want by Derek Seavers. He was the founder of CD Baby. And um, he has 40 lessons for a new kind of entrepreneur. And we're going to actually read two of those lessons today. I did tell you that we were going to come back to the book Watch Your Mouth by Tony Evans as we talk about understanding the power of our tongue. We've been in this book every Tuesday, um, but I do do want to go over some things today so that we can kind of speed up our time in this book and get through some more important parts about the mouth and speech. And if you take a look... At the shirt I'm wearing, this is a business that I would like to promote today. And the shirt says, do good, seek justice, help the oppressed. And it comes from Isaiah 1 and 17. I am enjoying this shirt. I am enjoying the feel of it. And you can do two things. You can support a business. You can support an activist for social justice. And her name is Megan Matt. Megan Matt sells these shirts as well as other shirts that have to do with social justice as well. Um, And so her website is MeganMatt.com. And you can find out a little bit more about the work that she's doing in the community of of Baton Rouge, uh, Louisiana where they have all of the issues going on with taking down the Confederate statues. Uh, She is uh, right in the heat of that, and she serves on the board uh, for improving the community under uh, their new mayor, Sharon Broom West. So you can check her out, and proceeds from this shirt goes to the Equal Justice Initiative. Equal Justice Initiative. And if you haven't heard of the Equal Justice Initiative, um, you may have heard of Brian Stevenson. He is the founder of the Equal Justice Initiative, and he is the author of this book that we're going to be reading in the fall called Just Mercy, A Story of Justice and Redemption. He started a company, a nonprofit, uh, called the Equal Justice Initiative, You can look them up on Facebook and see all of the wonderful work that they're doing. Part of what they do is to help uh, prisoners get lighter sentences to make sure people aren't being put into jail for things that they did not do. Um, He's also um, one of the founders of something that is really close to my heart, which is the issue of lynching in America. Um, He has, and this is him on the back of the book, So you can see him. 
he has um, created a lynching museum where they're actually going around and collecting soil samples from the places that black people were lynched in this country and they're actually creating a museum um, so that we will have a place or people will have a place to go and really think about all of the unanswered for innocent shed blood of our ancestors through that time of the lynching period. Did you know that just about over 5,000 people in this country were lynched and nobody has ever been charged with that crime? So that's a lot of unanswered for death, all right? Um, so by, uh, Brian Stevenson is the author of Just Mercy. And if you check out Megan Matt's website and you order one of her shirts that have to do with social justice, um, the proceeds from those shirts will go to supporting the Equal Justice Initiative. All right. So that is our business highlight for today. Let's get into Anything You Want by Derek Sievers. We're going to look at two of his uh, lessons for a new kind of entrepreneur. Remember, he is talking about thinking outside of the box. And we talked about him before with his um, extraordinary uh, growth with uh, founding CD Baby. Remember, at the time, it was the only music distribution uh, platform for independent artists. So he really helped to launch a lot of artists that wouldn't otherwise um, have been launched unless they had gone through a formal record company. And um, we know that most of that, unfortunately, is pretty rigged, uh, meaning that you have to know someone who knows someone who knows someone to really get your uh, music out there or to get a contract and get signed for a period of time. But CD Baby actually kind of leveled the playing field some for independent artists. And so I say to Derek Sievers, thank you, thank you, thank you. Because that's how my music got out. All right. So here is two lessons. His first lesson says, why no advertising? Why no advertising? I got a call from an advertising salesman saying he would like to run banner ads at the top and bottom of my website, cdbaby.com. I said, no way, out of the question. That would be like putting a Coke machine in a monastery. I'm not doing this to make money. He said, but you're a business. What do you mean you're not trying to make money? This goes back to the utopian perfect world ideal of why we're doing what we're doing in the first place. In a perfect world, would your website be covered with advertising? When you've asked your customers what would improve your service, has anyone said, fill your website with more advertising? Nope, so don't do it. So his advice is keep the main thing the main thing and um, keep your advertising down to a minimum on your website. If you have to do advertising, um, you can do it in the form of like sponsorships or things like that, but he's talking specifically for your website, um, you know, people say, well, you can, mon you can monetize your website, you can monetize your blog, you can. Um, you can monetize your YouTube channel, um, you can. But also in the monetization of YouTube, you can also decide how much advertising you want to flow through your channel. I know mine is, um, excuse me, I know mine is a minimum where... Um, I think the advertising runs for five seconds and then the person can click off of it. So they have an option of not watching a whole bunch of ads before they look at videos on my page. And then there are certain things, certain videos on my page that I don't have commercials on specifically um, if, you know, they're tied to something like prayer or something like that. I don't monetize those particular videos. So uh, YouTube does give you some options with your monetizing so that it's not just nonstop commercials. That's why if you go on YouTube, some of the videos have a 30-second mandatory 
advertisement that plays all the way through those 30 seconds um, before you can watch the video. It's because those people who have the channel have chosen that option that forces you to watch a commercial for 30 seconds. And sometimes it's, I think it's every five or 10 minutes if their video is a certain length another commercial will come back on and you'll be forced to watch that commercial before you can continue their video. So there are different ways that you can kind of scale down how much um, advertising is on your page. All right, the second tip he has here is this is just one of many options. This is just one of many options. He says, I used to take voice lessons from a great teacher for each lesson, I'd bring in one song I was trying to improve. First, I'd sing it for him as written, and then he'd say, okay, now do it up an octave. Up an octave, but I can't sing that high. He said, I don't care, do it anyway. I'd sing the whole song again in screeching, squeaking falsetto, sounding like an undead cartoon mouse. But by the second half of the song, it was almost charming. Then he'd say, okay, now sing the song down an octave. Down an octave, but I don't think I can. Doesn't matter. I sounded like a garbage disposal or a lawnmower, but he made me sing the whole song that way. Then he'd make me sing it twice as fast, then twice as slow. Then like Bob Dylan, and then like other singers. He'd tell me to sing it like it's 4 a.m., and a friend woke me up. And then he'd give me many other scenarios. After all of this, I'd say, now how did that song go again? It was the clearest proof that what I thought was the way the song went was really just one of an infinite number of options. I'm talking, I'm taking an entrepreneur class now. I've never studied business before. We analyzed a business plan for a mail order pantyhose company. Like all business plans, it proposed only one idea. After reading the whole thing, I felt like saying things my old voice teacher would say. Okay, make a plan that requires only $1,000. Now make a plan for 10 times as many customers. Now do it without a website. Now make all your initial assumptions wrong and have it work anyway. Now, now show us how to franchise it. You can't pretend there's only one way to do it. Your first idea is just one of many options. No business goes as planned, so make 10 radically different plans. Same thing with your current path in life. You're maybe living in New York City and success, and you're obsessed with success. Get out of there. Maybe you're a free spirit backpacking around a foreign country. Do something different. Maybe you're a confident extrovert and everyone loves you. Go spend some time in quiet. <laughs> now you're married and your kids are your life. You're just married and your kids are your life because you're not going to go find another wife or a husband. <laughs> now you spend a few years in relative seclusion, reading and walking. Go and be out amongst other people. So the idea here is... When you're talking about your business, you need to be prepared that what you have planned is just one of many options. You need to be prepared to think outside of the box and you need to be ready to make changes and not freak out when something goes wrong in your business that you were not planning for, that you were not prepared for. And I will tell you this, even with your best preparation this is what my husband and I learned even with your best preparations for life life happens and all your preparation goes out the window so <laughs> um and when that does happen I have found that for some people it can make them meaning it will f it, it forces them to come to this place here where you have to realize that life has many options or it breaks them because some people can't get over that one thing that they failed in. Um, and so they never move past it. They never move past that place of failure. Or, um, you know, as in our case, there were, there were people involved in 
us having to make other options for life. And some people never get over the people who were instrumental in making sure they failed. Some people are still there. They're still stuck in who let them down or who ruined their career or um, who put them into debt, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so they never get over the, the, the tragedy, right? They never get over it. And so they can't move forward with their life. And so I encourage you today, as he is saying here, think about life and think about the fact, even in business, that there's just one of many options. And if something doesn't work, I believe it was John Maxwell who, who penned the book, Failing Forward. If something doesn't work and you fail at it, don't stay there and don't go backwards, but fail forward. Take what you learned in that process. Take what you learned in that thing that didn't work out and use it to propel you to the next place. You don't have to get stuck on the issue of failure. You're going to mess up. There are things that we mess up in life. And thankfully, God is not like people. <laughs> he doesn't count us out when we mess up. We just learn from what happened. If necessary, if we did something that was sinful, then we repent. But did you know every mistake is not a sin? Just let that sink in. All right. So we mess up. We recognize what our mistake is. And then we move forward. Right. We move forward. So that was one of the things that my husband and I learned in life. Um, we wound up in a place where <clears throat> where we were uh, defrauded uh, with some information. And, um, you know. We, we trusted people, we trusted family members, and those family members lied to us and defrauded us, and we wound up in a place where we had no home. Um, I, lost my, I lost my car, we lost our home, um, and we had to, at the time, empty out our savings. And so we could have just stayed there and said, I can't believe this happened to us, are we ever going to recover, are we ever going to come back? Um, but now, after about five years, we are now in a place of recovery where God has begun to restore the things that were lost. Could we stay in a place of anger? Could we stay in a place of resentment? We could, but it wouldn't do our life any good, right? Um, and so we have learned to let some things go and to not allow what happened in the past to hold us back from the grand and great and glorious future that God has planned for us. One thing that we learned through the process is that people can fail. People can abandon you. People can write you off. People can think that you're at the end of the line and that nothing else good is going to happen in your life. But God, <clears throat> the one that you trust in, will still be there when everything else fails and when everyone else leaves. And when everyone else doubts you. So, you know, we have learned that God is our hope, that God is our shield, that God is our buckler, that God is our protector. That even as we went through the process of loss, we didn't lose God. <laughs> I mean, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> Listen, if you're going through the process of loss right now, let me tell you something. You can lose everything. But please, don't lose God because he is the one that can restore you. He is the one that can, can keep your mind. He is the one that can give you the idea or the creative ability to get back up again. All right? So when I talk, I'm not talking from a place of having been, haven't not been there. I'm talking from a place of I have been there. All right? You can get back up again. You can start over. You don't have to stay in the place of despair or discouragement or despondency. Remember, he said, even with his business plan, this is just one of many options. One of many options. So God will 
restore you. You just have to trust him. And I know that sounds easier said than done. I get it. <clears throat> As uh, Travis Green says, when your back is against the wall and it's looking like it's all over, God can still make a way. He can. As for me, that's not just a song. That was actual reality. Trusting God, knowing that, okay, I have gifts, I have talents, I have ability, I have skill. And so whatever's happening in my life right now, that's not the end of the story. As long as I have breath in my body, as long as God keeps waking me up, I'm going to continue to get back up again. As long as God keeps waking me up, he's telling me I have another opportunity to do better. I have another opportunity to move forward. I have another opportunity to make the best of where I am and to trust God that if I'm doing everything in my power to get out of a situation that I was put in, that God is going to come alongside me, the Holy Spirit, the paraclete, the helper, is going to come alongside me and he's going to help me where I can't help myself. All right? So those are our business tips on today. I hope that was helpful for you. Hope that was encouraging. We are coming back to this book, Watch Your Mouth, Understanding the Power of the Tongue. And we are on the chapter, Lord of Our Lips. Lord of Our Lips. That's what we've been talking about. <clears throat> Where we left off was... Talking about how quickly the tongue can turn. And unless our heart and our minds and our thoughts are aligned under God, there is no telling what will come out of our mouth. Now, this is Wealth Building Friday, but let me just say that a part of wealth building is being able to control your tongue. Somebody can put some hearts on the screen because I know somebody agrees with that. <laughs> Only when Jesus is Lord of our lives. Will he also be Lord of our lips? Remember, the tongue is like the steering of a ship. It can determine which direction the ship is going to go in. It can determine whether you wind up in an impoverished state or it can determine if you wind up in a wealth building state. Tony Evans goes on to say here, the word Lord means master. To declare Jesus as Lord means that he is the one in control and he is calling the shots in your life and speech. To say the word Lord implies that he is the one controlling the discussion, your language, and your actions because he is the master. In fact, to call Jesus Lord is to call yourself a bond servant to him. This shows up in Romans where Paul opens with these words. Paul, a slave or a bond servant of Christ Jesus, called as an apostle and singled out for God's good news. Christ's half-brother James opens his book in a similar way. James, a slave of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Jude, also a half-brother of Jesus, writes Jude, a slave of Jesus Christ and a brother of James. Each of these leaders in the establishment of the Christian faith considered himself a bond servant. The job of a bond servant is to follow the dictates of the master. As children of God, we are Christ's bond servants. Yet too many of us want to be like Peter and simply use the word Lord while spouting our own opinions. We want Jesus as Savior, but don't want him messing with us as Lord. When Jesus is your Lord, he is not your personal assistant. He's not your co-pilot. He is not even your mentor. Jesus Christ owns you when he is Lord. Somebody put that on the screen. <laughs> he owns me. And we can almost see that even though many of us 
have accepted him as savior, right? As redeemer, as rescuer, we can look at some of our lives and see that even though he saved us, he doesn't quite own us yet. Mm, mm, mm. So Jesus Christ died to own you. To own you. <laughs> yes, please help us, Jesus. Because... When you realize that Jesus died to own you, then, and you understand the nature of a bond servant, we're not talking about a cruel slave master, but when you understand the nature of a bond servant, you understand that a bond servant did not do anything without the owner's permission. I know, I know it's not popular. <laughs> And when I got saved and I realized that Jesus is now not just Savior, but Lord, and I began to do the study on Lordship, then I began to change my disposition toward Jesus the Christ. And I began to do things um, like asking God, <clears throat> like asking God, where should I go today? Okay, I know what's on my schedule, but where should I go today? What route should I take to work? I know this is the way I usually drive, but what route do you want me to take today? And I can't tell you how many accidents I was saved from. I got into some supernatural salvation in those as well. But I can't tell you how many accidents I missed on the days when I would normally have gone the, uh, the regular way to my job and God said, no, take this street. Leave five minutes later today. I'm just, I mean, just basic, simple things. God, what should I put on today? What do you want me to wear today? And there's, there's actually been two occasions where God told me specifically what to put on. And later I had people come up to me to tell me that in their prayer time, they had been looking for an answer. And God told them, you will see this person wearing X, Y, and Z. I sent them, go up to them and ask them this question. And that's happened to me on two occasions since I've been saved. So deciding that Jesus is Lord in your life means that you're going to give him free reign to tell you what to do. You're going to give him free reign to tell you how to move. You're going to give him free reign to tell you when to speak and when to be silent. When to participate in something and when to not participate in it. And as you develop this practice, right, of going to God first, this is what I've learned. As you develop the practice of going to God first and you begin to get your heart in a posture, right? Many churchgoers, but very few slaves agree. You get yourself in a posture to hear God's answer as God sees your faithfulness in continuing to go to him to ask him for an answer. What you will find is the spirit of God will begin to speak to your heart and he will begin to guide and direct you sometimes before you get up to say, what can I do today? You'll start getting those instructions internally. Just trying to help somebody. I know there's a lot of people that say, I don't hear God telling me jack. I don't hear God saying anything to me. I want to encourage you to begin to get into the habit of seeking God out first. Get up and say, okay, God, what is on our agenda today? What do you want me to do today? 
What do you want me to do today? This is what I have scheduled. If you say cross something out of the schedule today, I'm open to that. These are the errands I want to run. If you say not today, do it tomorrow, do it on the weekend. I'll cross it out. I am ready to hear from you. I know. I know we want like big, huge instructions like go and tell the president to repent. But guess what? If he can't even get you to put on the pair of shoes that he wants you to put on, why would he send you to D.C. to tell the president to repent? It starts with simple, consistent obedience. Let's keep reading. If Jesus Christ died to own you, this means that you and I need to take a subservient position to his rule, surrendering to him as master over our thoughts, words, and life. Before Doubting Thomas came face to face with Jesus after his resurrection, he said he wouldn't believe unless he saw the holes in his hands and the hole in his side. This is in John chapter 20, verse 25. When Jesus revealed himself to Doubting Thomas, Thomas exclaimed, My Lord and my God. This is because he understood that to authentically call him Lord meant he was also God. The crisis we face in Christianity is that very few believers are willing to become Christ's slaves, exactly as Lady Apostle said this morning. Very few Christians want to be owned by God. Just say law that for a moment. (laughs) They want to be blessed by God, right? They certainly want that. But very few Christians want to be owned by God. They want him to heal them. They want him to provide for them. But they do not want God to own them. Most of us treat Jesus the way the British treat the Queen of England. The Queen of England has a title. She just doesn't have any clout. Her subjects recognize her. And pay homage to her, but she doesn't get to pass any laws or make any decisions on national concerns. Do do you know what they give the Queen of England for her role? They only give her a weekly meeting. Once a week, she meets with the Prime Minister to get an update on the country. And too often, we do the same with God. We come to church once a week to get our religious update, but we certainly won't let Jesus make any of our decisions. Just say law that. Okay. We aren't going to allow him to control our lives or influence how we speak. We will use his name up front just as Peter did, but without God attached to it. We call him Lord without surrendering to what the title really means. I'm not saying we're evil because we try to take so much control of our language and what we say. Peter didn't mean harm by trying to protect Jesus or by telling him that everything was going to be okay. After all, he was just trying to help his brother out. He hears Jesus say that he's on his way to the cross to suffer and die. And Peter responds with pushback and puts up his hand and says, not on my watch. You know, so Peter thinks he's doing a good thing. But that's precisely when Christ calls him the devil. Because that's precisely when Peter turns him, turned himself into his own God. He chose his own will and his own desires above God, which is exactly what Lucifer did just before he got the boot out of heaven. The enemy uses your mouth anytime you speak that which stems from your own desires and perspectives 
rather than the Lord's. That holds true even if those desires and perspectives aren't evil by our world standards. So, don't become a tool of the enemy in your own life or in the life of someone else. The moment Peter got out of the out of the revelatory position, remember, because Peter was the same one that said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. The moment he got out of the revelatory position, he now positions himself to be used by the enemy through his speech. Whenever your desires disagree with God and what he wants, you are speaking outside of his will. It doesn't matter if you use his name just as Peter did. People do that all the time. They put God's name on stuff that God has nothing to do with. And then they say things that don't align with God. There's no greater example of that right now than what some are now calling the cult of evangelical Christianity. God's name is stamped all over what is happening in our country right now. People have stamped God's name all on it. Oh, God is doing this. God is bringing us back. God is bringing repentance. God is bringing Merry Christmas back. God, 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 God. And God is saying, I have absolutely nothing to do with this. <laughs> As one person said, I can't remember who said it. He said, this is people prophesying out of their ethnicity. This has nothing to do with the righteousness and the holiness and the grace of God. If it did, it would have people turning to God and not further away from God. Just look up the definition of revival and awakening. The actual revivals and awakenings that happen in our country turned people to God. People shut down nightclubs. People shut down bars. People were in the streets on their face crying out to God, repenting. That was an awakening. Not what you see right now. This is not an awakening. Culture prophets, you're correct. So they put God's name on stuff that God has nothing to do with and they don't say the things that align with him. Peter didn't like what Jesus said so he rejected it and argued instead. That's one argument you'll never want to have an argument with God. You will lose every time. One thing you should never say is, Jesus, I think you're wrong. That's just you talking. That's the devil using you. Now, I have, I have told God a couple times that I thought he was wrong, and of course, I was wrong. How about that? <laughs> but it was because, again... It was because I was operating off of my own desires at the time and I wanted my desires to be right. So we have to examine ourselves and we have to say, are we putting our desires above what God wants? Anytime you're doing that, you are allowing the enemy to use you. And then you, of course, must repent. Get behind me. Peter used his mouth to join in on a view that was outside the will of God, even though it was camouflaged by the use of the word Lord. For Christ to be Lord of your lips, you have to give him more than that one word. The entire sentence, paragraph, and point need to be surrendered and aligned to his will. We're going to stop here for part one and we're going to come back for part two and we're going to finish up this chapter, Lord of your lips. So I hope that you will come back in 60 seconds for part two and join us as we complete this study. See you in 60 seconds.